Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time we could spend thinking about your word. We pray that you would uh, continue to teach us by your spirit, that you would conform us more and more to the image of your Son, that you would uh, fill our hearts and minds with love and devotion to you. We pray that you would make us good readers and good hearers of your word. Uh, We pray that we would not be hearers only, but also doers of all that you've commanded that we would trust your promises with our whole heart, that we would sing your praises uh, with uh, our souls, and that we would walk in faithfulness to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I stopped before the uh, end of session three. Uh, I had talked about uh, words, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the phenomenon of text and intertextuality. And the question that uh, we can use to set this up is, uh, we've been talking about uh, how to uh, capture a fullness of meaning in a text in scripture. How can we do that without putting words in God's mouth, which is obviously something we don't want to do. We want to hear and uh, receive everything that God has spoken to us, but we don't want to uh, force the scriptures to say things that they haven't said. So how do we go about capturing as much of the fullness of the text as we can uh, without uh, importing things that uh, God hasn't actually spoken? Uh, How can we, in other words, uh, in terms that I was using earlier, how can we uh, make use, wisely make use of those uh, truths and uh, 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 information from outside the text? How can we Uh, make wise use of those so that we can interpret the text well. And I want to highlight three different factors, and these all really have to do with the, uh, with inner biblical interpretation, how the Bible works internally to itself and less with how we uh, bring extra biblical uh, information or extra biblical data into play in interpreting scripture. I want to uh, point to, first of all, to the phenomenon of intertextuality and how that uh, uh, can help us get the fullness of the, of the meaning of, of scriptures, capture that. Uh, I want to talk about scenic reading, uh, and particularly scenic reading as it's rooted in uh, Genesis 1 and 2, and think about how the, the uh, uh, biblical imagery uh, grows out of those chapters. Uh, that'll be very brief in comparison to what we could say about that. And then I want to talk about the uh, sequence of the text and how the text has musical qualities and uh, how that affects our how that uh, affects our reading and again our effort to grasp the fullness of what God has spoken to us. Uh, intertextuality is a term that goes uh, it, it applies to a number of different kinds of phenomena. When I use the word intertextuality, I'm talking about um, the uh, the use of uh, a writer's use of prior texts within uh, the text that he's writing. Uh, a, uh, a clear and uh, 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 unquestioned example of this is the way that Virgil uses the Homeric epics in his Aeneid. Um, the entire Aeneid is, uh, a, is structured by reference to the Homeric epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, Aeneas goes through a basically an Odyssey in the first half of the book, uh, the first half of the Aeneid, he goes through an Iliad kind of experience in the second half of the Aeneid. Uh, So the big structure of the Aeneid is uh, indebted to the Homeric epics. But then there are particular passages in the Aeneid that have specific reference to episodes and scenes in the Homeric epics. Uh, There's a scene early in the Aeneid, for example, where Aeneas comes into a cove. Uh, He sails into a cove. It has a uh, pointy line description of the cove, the caves in the cove, the peacefulness of the water. He's just come out of the, off the sea and the sea has been raging. He's found a place of peace and quiet and there's caves along the, uh, along the shore. There are nymphs inside the caves and it has this scene of uh, 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 peacefulness and welcome uh, that is uh, pulled almost word for word at places from uh, the Odyssey. Um, if, if Virgil were operating under modern copyright laws, 
he'd be in he'd be getting a letter from uh, the uh, the custodian of the Homer estate uh, for plagiarizing this earlier epic. It's the the, the passage is that close. Uh, that's intertextuality in a in an obvious sense. He's, there's this uh, lengthy allusion, lengthy set of allusions to an, a previous text. But it's also it, uh, it, uh, 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 Virgil is doing something quite different with that text than Homer was doing with it. Um, and in order to capture, in order to get what Virgil is up to in that passage, you really have to know what the scene was in the Odyssey. Uh, in the Odyssey, when, when uh, Odysseus comes into that setting, when he sails into that cove, uh, he's, sailing into, he's sailing to Ithaca. He's at home. Uh, this is in, right in the middle. I think it's the uh, beginning of Book Nine of the uh, uh, of the uh, Odyssey. It's the beginning of his progress toward his home. He's just come to his home island. He's going to make a progression onto his own palace. He's eventually going to take his palace back, and he's going to have a reunion with Penelope. And the beginning of that is this scene of uh, uh, peace and calmness coming into this cove uh, in uh, in Ithaca. It's a it's a genuine homecoming for. Um, Odysseus. Uh, when Virgil draw, uh, borrows this poetry, borrows this description, and it, uh, it puts it into his own epic, he's describing the scene as Aeneas comes into Carthage. That's the uh, landfall at Carthage. Carthage is not home for Aeneas. Uh, Italy is going to be home, uh, and he's going to have to keep going, but Carthage is going to be a uh, false home. You might remember the whole uh, Carthage Queen of Dido, uh, Dido Queen of Carthage storyline that follows from that. Uh, Aeneas um, has uh, some kind of affair with Dido, leaves Dido suicidal uh, as he sails off to Italy. He has to move on. He's not home. But Virgil has put this homecoming scene in the middle of a scene of a false homecoming. Uh, that, that description is not just a very lovely description of a, of a peaceful setting uh, after, after a, uh, uh, enduring the various challenges and dangers of the sea, but it's also, it's kind of this inversion. It leads to an expectation of homecoming, not only for Aeneas, but for the reader. The reader who, who's aware of the Homeric scene is anticipating, oh, he's finally home. He's finally in the place he's supposed to be because He's, he's Odysseus, and he's coming into this setting. Uh, but Virgil's using it. Virgil, Virgil's using it differently. Uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of twist, using, reusing the same text, reusing the same scene, but giving it this kind of inversion, is part of the phenomenon of intertextuality. Not necessarily. Sometimes the, the goal is to draw connections and analogies rather than con contrasts. But in that case, the... The purpose, uh, Virgil's purpose, is to highlight the, uh, uh, in, in a sense, to anticipate, to um, lull the reader into the sense of security that uh, Aeneas himself is experiencing. But the Bible is full of uh, intertextual connections like that. Sometimes it's they're marked and signaled by verbal connections between different passages, and so that you're reading one passage and there's a verbal connection that takes you to another passage. And you have to read the passage that you're looking at in the light of, as some kind of in some kind of comparison contrast with the passage that you're looking at, and you have to you recognize that there's a, a replay of a particular uh, a particular scene uh, in the passage uh, that uh, that uh, has an intertextual relation with the with the previous text. Uh, a couple of examples, one fairly simple one, and then I'll, I'll read a passage from First Samuel. The, the simple one is the way that the Exodus uses the, the word for ark uh, in Exodus 2. Uh, so uh, common comment on um, the story of Moses in his basket, uh, that the basket, the word for basket there, is used only a couple of times in the Old Testament. It's used for the basket of Moses, it's used for the ark of Noah. If you look up ark in an English Bible, Bible concordance, you'll find lots of uses of the word ark. Uh, referring to the Ark of the Covenant, that's a completely different word that means something more like coffer or box. Uh, the word for Ark is used only in these two passages of Noah and of Moses. 
Um, that's just a, a slight verbal connection, but it's enough to alert us to the fact that we should read the story of Moses in his small ark as a uh, somehow a replay and read it in the light of the story of uh, the story of Noah. Um, and we can think about various analogies. I mean, uh, uh, Moses is going to pass through water a couple of times. He's going to do it as a as an infant. In fact, his name means uh, drawn from the water, something along those lines. Uh, he's, uh, he begins his life with a kind of exodus, passing safely through the waters, the waters that have been killing the infants of, uh, of Israel, the waters that are the place where they've been drowning. So it's the graveyard of Israelite boys. And Moses is saved through the waters in this ark. Uh, of course, that's anticipating his later leading of Israel when Israel as a whole is going to be saved through the waters. Uh, that also gives another dimension. It gives, the, the connection gives a dimension to the story of Moses that we might not catch otherwise. Uh, Noah, Noah goes through the death waters of the flood in his ark and then becomes the founder of a new humanity. He's the, he's the new Adam. And there are these various uh, uh, quotations from Genesis 1 that are repeated in Genesis 8 and 9 describing Noah in his new world. Now he's the one who's supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, he's, going to be the, he's going to be the restart of the human race. Um, that's not so obvious when we just read Exodus by itself. When we see this link with Noah, then we realize that Moses too is passing through the waters as the uh, beginning point, as a kind of new Adam, as the head of a new humanity. Not now uh, an entire human race as it was with Noah, but instead a new form of humanity, a new kind of humanity within Israel. And he's going to be the, uh, the Lord's designated founder for that new humanity. Um, there are various other analogies you could draw, but it's uh, the, the, the allusion to the uh, story of Noah's Ark is uh, part of the connection there. You could also spin out analogies with the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, Babel and the Ark are both um, uh, put up with pitch. Pitch is used to put together the ark and put, uh, Noah's ark. Pitch is used on the, uh, the Tower of Babel. Pitch is used to uh, waterproof the ark of Moses. Uh, and uh, that connection, there's, a, there's a, a narrative linkage that you can bring those, uh, those different passages together too. The other passage I wanted to look at was um, a little strange little episode in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 19. This is uh, in the, con it's the, the larger context is uh, Samuel uh, um, has uh, been brought into Saul's home uh, as uh, the one who plays the, the harp to drive away the evil spirit. He's defeated Goliath. He's become the hero of Israel, uh, celebrated more than Saul is celebrated. And Saul now is uh, envying him and has tried to kill him a couple of times. And so uh, David is on the run and Saul is trying to pin him down. David is, of course, not just a bodyguard in Saul's service and, and a uh, musician in Saul's court, but he's also Saul's son-in-law. So there's an inter-family conflict here. Beginning in verse 11 of uh, 1 Samuel 19, then Saul sent messages to David's house to watch him in order to put, to put him to death in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be put to death. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. And Michal took the household idol and laid it on the bed, and put a quilt of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. Then Saul sent messengers to take, uh, to take David, she said, uh, for she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me on his bed that I may put him to death. <laughs> um, kind of extreme. Um, when, uh, when the messenger, he might be dying of sickness, but I want to speed the process along. When the messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed with a quilt of goats here at its head. So Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go that he has escaped? And Michal said to Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I put you to death? Um, so this is an escape of David, one of the many escapes of David. But it has some interesting features to it. Uh, you have... Uh, Michal, uh, David's wife, who is the king's daughter, uh, is deceiving her own father 
to let David go. David escapes through a window. That might bring up, connote, uh, bring up some, conjure up some other passages and stories in scripture. And Michal uses a household idol. The Hebrew word is teraphim. She uses uh, teraphim in order to deceive her father, her father's messengers, into thinking that um, David is uh, sick. Maybe the uh, teraphim are in the bed like a dummy with the goat's hair at the top, um, making it look like there's a lump in the bed and David's in bed. Uh, maybe the household gods are set up at the foot of the bed like you know, these are going to be the, these are the gods are going to heal David. Somehow she's using the teraphim to uh, carry out this deception of her father and of his messengers. There's a number of, a number of different uh, threads of, uh, of Old Testament, uh, a number of different stories that are alluded to here that have kind of intertextual relation with this story. But the teraphim are the one I want to focus on. Uh, the only other time that teraphim are mentioned in the Old Testament are, uh, is, is in uh, Genesis 31. Genesis 31 is the story of Jacob's escape from Laban's house. Jacob escapes at night from Laban's house, takes his wives and his <coughs> children and his flocks and herds and leaves. Um, you might remember the role of the teraphim in that, in that story where uh, Laban comes and he's looking for his teraphim. He's looking for his household gods that he believes that Jacob has stolen. Rachel has taken them and Rachel's in her tent sitting on them and she claims she can't get up because she has her period. Uh, if that's true, then she's sitting and defiling the household gods of her father. Uh, but she deceives her father about the household gods in order to protect her, uh, in order, in some way to protect her husband as in, in part of a getaway story, right? Um, so uh, in, that, in that setting, Saul is playing the role of, La uh, if you put the two passages together, Saul is playing the role of Laban. David is in the role of Jacob. Michal is uh, in the role of uh, Rachel. Uh, and you have this escape scene that happens at night uh, where David is, uh, gets away from Saul. Uh, that's, uh, that connects the two passages, but it's part of a, uh, a, an overall structure within 1 Samuel, where Samuel is following, basically following the story of Israel and the story of Jacob. David is reliving Jacob's own life story. And uh, if you want further evidence of this, um, uh, my commentary on Samuel develops this at some length. In, uh, it's called a, a Son to Me. Um, but uh, uh, David is living through the history of uh, Jacob, the life story of Jacob. He's living through the history of Israel. David himself has taken on this role as kind of embodying the nation of Israel and reliving their history. Uh, which I think in the, in the context of Samuel, that's part of the whole theology of the Davidic covenant. The whole Davidic covenant is uh, about the king taking this role in Israel, that he's going to play, be the, the, the son to Yahweh and Yahweh is going to be his father. Prior to Samuel's, uh, prior to 2 Samuel and the covenant with David, that sonship role is played by Israel, by the nation. Now that is going to be concentrated on one person, on the king. And as preparation for that, we have this long narrative where David is living through the history of Israel. He, we actually see that he's embodying Israel in his own life story. He's reliving the whole history of the nation. So that, uh, that intertextual connection with J uh, Laban is interesting as a literary device and kind of fun to notice. And you see this uh, connection between the different characters. But it's not just a random uh, literary flourish. It's part of a whole theology of the Davidic king and the Davidic covenant as being the embodiment of uh, the nation of Israel. So uh, that's an example of a intertextual connections where you're borrowing from uh, earlier passages and they're, uh, they're contained within new passages. You have to read the two of them together. Another uh, way that we go about uh, finding the, uh, trying to capture the fullness, grasp the fullness of a passage uh, is by trying to read scenically. Um, and uh, this is a, goes back to the comments I was making earlier about the, the, way we, the way we infer things from texts that they don't explicitly say. Part of that has to do with uh, our trained expectations about certain kinds of stories and certain kinds of scenes. Uh, for example, 
Uh, suppose you're watching a film. Uh, the, you have a few opening credits, and the camera pans across a dusty, unpaved road. Uh, a ball of tumbleweed is blown across the road. I don't have to say much more, and I think you know what kind of movie we're in. <laughs> exactly. All right, we're in a Western. How do we know that? It hasn't said this is a Western, maybe the advertising did. But if, that's, if you didn't know anything about, the, any, anything about the movie, you're instantly in a certain setting. You're, you're expecting certain things to happen, certain kinds of characters to come up. So the camera moves into the town, moves toward the saloon doors. The saloon doors open. Who's going to come out? <laughs> it might be a gunfight, right? It might be the, the marshal. It might be, you know, the local, the, the woman who heads the local brothel. Um, uh, what if it's um, Stephen Hawking? <laughs> yeah. why, why is that funny? Why would it be funny for Stephen Hawking to come out of a saloon in that kind of setting? Well, it's because the scene itself has led to certain expectations about where this story is going. And when those expectations are violated, uh, we now, now have a, we have a different kind of story. We have, a, we have a, uh, some kind of parody of a Western story. Uh, we you know, don't know what it is yet, but uh, our, our, our movie-watching our movie watching expectations are formed by scenes like that. And I think scripture often works in the same way. Uh, we didn't need much. All I gave you was a dusty road and tumbleweed, and I had somebody whistling the, uh, what is it, the good, the bad, and the ugly? <laughs> uh, that's all you needed to get you, get you into a Western. Um, the Bible works the same way and often gives us just uh, a, it's like a caricature artist with a line or two uh, of a scene. But that should be enough to uh, put us right into a full scene, to capture a full scene. If, if for example, uh, you have a reference to um, a jackal in the Bible. What kind of setting are you in? Desert. You're in the desert, in the wilderness, right? Um, and then if you have an elaborate description of a wilderness and then uh, it blossoms like a rose, something, some new life springs up. Where are you if you've got a rose springing up from a Wilderness. You're, you have a wilderness that's being turned into uh, an oasis, right? Or a garden. Okay. Um, Psalm 1, the righteous man is like a tree. That's one of those uh, analogies that I mentioned. That I, uh, It's the kind of analogy I mentioned at the beginning of the day where you have a built-in relationship that I think is already uh, hinted at in Genesis 1. The first fruitful things in the world are plants. God on day three calls the, <clears throat> commands the earth to spring up with uh, grasses with seed and fruit trees with fruit in them. And they are uh, their first, the first fruitful thing. And then when God creates animals and human beings on the sixth day, uh, they're, also, they're commanded to be fruitful and multiply and replenish and fill the earth. Uh, there's an analogy there between uh, plants as fruitful things and animals and human beings as fruitful things. And that sets up this long... Uh, and very rich vein of imagery throughout the scriptures that uh, links up human beings with various kinds of uh, various kinds of plants. A righteous man is like a tree. Okay. A righteous man is like a tree planted by streams of water. Do we need any more to know what scene we're in? Again, we're in an oasis. We're in a garden setting. A righteous man is not just flourishing, well-supplied, green, fruitful into old age. But we should take the Edenic reference seriously. A righteous man is like a small recovery of Eden. It's like a tree of life. And if that's not, uh, if you think that's reading too much, that's kind of explicit in several Proverbs where it says that the wise man or the righteous man is like a tree of life. There's a little recovery of Eden where you have a righteous man. Uh, that's, again, that's, that's the way the biblical imagery works. It doesn't it doesn't spell out every particular detail of the scene. It gives you a glimpse of one or two elements of the scene. 
And that's uh, supposed to be enough to alert us to where we are and to make those connections. And those connections are part of the theology of Psalm 1, for example. Part of the theology of Psalm 1 is to refer back to, to, the, uh, to the original garden and to see in uh, a righteous man this uh, recovery of Eden. Uh, throughout the Bible, too, there, the, the garden is the primary setting from which all other settings come. You have the cosmos that's created in Genesis 1. You have the garden setting that's given in uh, Genesis 2. And you could take, if you took the time just to list off the various elements in the garden setting, uh, the kinds of things that are there in Eden. There's a man there. There's water there. There are trees in the midst of the garden. Uh, there, there's a directionality to it. And all the different features, you know that it's on a high place. It's on a mountaintop. Or if not a mountaintop, it's on some kind of plateau on a high place. All these features of Eden uh, become part of, um, the, those are the root for the imagery of Scripture. Uh, mountaintops running throughout the whole of the Bible. Uh, rivers flowing as a sign of a restored Eden. Um, trees as a sign of a restored Eden or an oasis. But then that, that uh, garden setting gets transformed in various ways, and we have different recoveries of the garden. Uh, the tabernacle is a kind of recapitulation of the garden. It has uh, cherubic guardians uh, wove, woven into the curtains. Uh, it has uh, a man approaching God. Uh, it has food in the, in the courtyard. Uh, it's made of a glorified uh, uh, wood. Trees have been cut and shaped in order to make the, uh, in order to make the walls of the tabernacle. Uh, you have the, the curtains of the tabernacle are a glorification of uh, various kinds of plants and minerals that have been uh, put into, this, uh, into the curtains to make uh, this, uh, this sumptuous royal palace, this royal tent for Yahweh. That's the transformation of Eden. Um, and you can have, um, you have these, these different layers of scenes. You have Eden as the original uh, setting. You have the tabernacle as another setting. They're connected to each other. Uh, and those two begin to layer together. And so you, you, have, you can have imagery in the Bible that uh, alludes to, directly to the temple or the tabernacle, but implicitly alludes back to uh, Eden. Uh, imagery that, uh, for example, of pillars that are uh, re pillars that refer to the pillars, the various pillars in the temple, but ultimately refer back to the trees of the garden. And you have this... Uh, this, uh, again, rich vein of imagery that's building on top of each other. So uh, learning to read scenically is a way to pick up the fullness of Scripture uh, and to get the, uh, what, uh, the various uh, things that are Im Im implied by fairly simple imagery, but simple imagery placed in the context of the Scriptures uh, conjures up and connotes all these other things. Um, lastly, I want to talk about the sequence and uh, the arrangement of texts. The first uh, simple point is that the way the story is told matters. The order of the story is, uh, is important for the, for the way the story, uh, what the story means. Uh, I talked about detective stories um, and got a, got a, a little outburst from, from James about Columbo. <laughs> um, I listed that detective stories are supposed to have, have a, generally have a certain shape to them. Um, and if you violate that shape, then the, the story has a, a lesser impact. I think, again, uh, jokes are a good way of thinking about this. Uh, you, uh, again, think about the way kids tell jokes. They can't wait to get to the punchline, so they start with the punchline. <laughs> uh, no, there's, there's got to be something, some setup. There's got to be an anticipation before the punchline comes. Uh, you can, if you turn jokes around, they can become quite uh, something quite different, not not funny at all, but uh, can be rather gruesome if they're uh, told in the wrong way. So the the way that the way that the, uh, a text is arranged, the way a story is told, the sequence of things within uh, an epistle of Paul, for example, uh, sometimes it's a logical sequence moving from one topic to another. Sometimes it has a different sort of uh, arrangement to it. But that arrangement, that form that you have in the text is part of the meaning of the text. Uh, you can't really separate form and content when you're talking about language. 
uh, written language is just uh, shapes on paper uh, that uh, that have meaning. They are in in the, in the physical sense. They are nothing but uh, forms on paper, forms of ink on paper. Uh, but that's what communicates the content. You can't think you're going to get to the real content by scraping away the form. I'm going to scrape away all the words on my page, and then I'll really be able to get to what the text means. Uh, that's you know that's a way of getting nothing because you're you're removing the very thing that can communicate. Form and content can't be separated that way. And the same thing is true at a larger level. The form of a text, a large text, uh, is part of what contributes to the. Uh, the content or the meaning of the text. Um, you could take many different examples of this, but in, for the sake of time, I'll just take uh, uh, I'll just take one. Actually, um, there's a uh, a common uh, formal shape to the uh, to biblical texts uh, that's known as chias chiasm or chiasm. Uh, it comes from the letter chi, which is an X, and it's a a crossing pattern. Uh, it's a pattern that, uh, it's a, or you could say a symmetrical pattern, where the first half of the text and the second half of the text mirror each other. Sometimes, uh, frequently around a central section that is a unique section. So the first half of the text goes A, B, C, you've got a middle section, and then C, B, A. And uh, scholars have pointed out that there are large-scale chiasms in the Bible. There are small-scale chiasms. Um, uh, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath is a chiasm. Lots of Jesus' uh, uh, sayings like that have a chiastic structure to them. One of the things that makes them pithy and memorable is this, uh, this symmetrical pattern that they have. But the same kind of where things that are building up in the first half begin to be reversed is that uh, right at the beginning of uh, uh, Genesis 8 uh, with the phrase, the Lord remembered Noah. Prior to that, the rain is falling, the waters are rising, the mountains are being covered, the Lord remembered Noah, then the mountains begin to appear, the rain, the rain stops, the mountains begin to appear, uh, and everything that was uh, moving, uh, toward, moving up in the first half is being reversed in the second half. And the, uh, the turning point of the story is the central, the, the formally central section of the story, which is the, the Lord remembering Noah in the midst of the ark and in the midst of the flood. And that uh, points to one important dimension of the meaning of that story uh, about the Lord's uh, care for Noah and the Lord as the one who, uh, remembering his covenant and remembering his commitment to Noah, is going to rescue him from that, from the flood. Okay. Um, Lots more we could say on all that. I'm going to say a few things about my final lecture so that I can uh, pretend like I got four lectures in. Um, the, uh, the last thing I was going to talk about was uh, being readers, uh, how, kind of a how-to. Um, I think I've been talking about how-to all along the way, but I want to talk specifically about what kind of, what kind of readers are good readers of Scripture. You can have all the rules in place. You can have the linguistic capacity. You can have sensitivity to literary features of a text and still not be a good reader of scripture because the qualifications to be a good reader of scripture have to do not just with all those uh, uh, linguistic, not just with the skill in the art of reading, uh, but they have to do with um, the character of the reader. Uh, our ears need to be opened. Our ears need to be opened not only in the sense that we want to hear everything that's being communicated in the text, but our near ears need to be opened in the sense that the Bible uses that image of open ear, particularly in uh, Psalm 40. Uh, Psalm 40 uh, says that um, the Lord does not require sacrifice or burnt offering, but rather seeks uh, from David, the psalmist, uh, seeks uh, an open ear. My ear you have opened. A sacrifice and meal offering thou hast not desired. My ears thou hast opened. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Thy law is writ written within my heart. Um, the real sacrifice that God is seeking 
is not an animal that's slaughtered and turned to smoke and rises to God. Uh, those are uh, acts of obedience uh, that are pleasing to God in the Old Covenant. But behind that, there has to be the sacrifice of the open ear. Uh, what David is alluding to there is the, the right that uh, is laid out in Exodus. A slave who wants to become a permanent household slave of his master uh, is uh, taken to the doorway of the house and his ear is uh, pierced. Uh, and uh, that's a signal, a symbol, that he is a, uh, a permanent slave of that household. Uh, the Bible sometimes talks about circumcised ears, and that's the kind of circumcision of the ear. It's an opening of the ear, a physical, literal opening of the ear lobe that symbolizes the fact that this servant is now going to have his ear open only to the voice of this master. He's going to be a permanent servant of that house. Uh, when the priest is ordained, he has a little bit of blood put on his right ear lobe, which is a symbol of the same thing. He's a servant of the Lord's house, and he's going to uh, have his ear opened only to the voice of Yahweh. He's going to be a permanent slave of Yahweh's house. Uh, when, when David says that uh, the, the sacrifice the Lord wants is the sacrifice of an open ear, he's talking about a sacrifice of obedience. The... Uh, 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 Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Hearing is connected with uh, obedience to God's word, to res proper response to God's word. Uh, and so uh, a good reader is somebody who has open ears, not only in the literary sense, but also in this uh, moral or spiritual sense, that our ears are open to the Lord's word. Uh, and I, there are a couple of different ways that we can unpack this. Some of this I, I mentioned already in response to some questions. Um, uh, we properly listen to the Word of God when, we, when we're doers of the Word of God. We don't, we don't actually, uh, we're not actually good readers or interpreters of Scripture unless we're also doers of that Word. List, hearers only are not, are not good readers. So there's a connection between um, obedience to the Word of God, whatever form that obedience might take, obedience to commandments or trust in promises or rejoicing at uh, when God calls us to rejoice and praise, whatever form that obedience takes, uh, that is a right kind of interpretation and response to the Word of God. And if we want to read the Word of God as good interpreters, we have to, that has to be uh, linked up with a life of uh, obedience, a life where our ears are open. And I think too that obedience is, uh, leads to insight and wisdom. The closer we're, we cling to the Lord, the, the more fully and wholeheartedly we obey Him, the more Scripture becomes clear to us. And sometimes the reason why Scripture is obscure to us has nothing to do with the obscurity of the text, but has a lot to do with the, uh, the fact that we're hardened against what the Lord is speaking to us. And the Lord perhaps has given us over to a spirit of confusion. And to, so uh, it's happened, happened several times in Israel's history that the Lord delivers them over to confusion and blindness so they, uh, and deafness so they can't hear what uh, God is speaking to them and can't see what he's clearly revealed. So there's, a, there's a, a cycle, a cyclical relationship. Obedience gives greater insight. Greater insight should lead us to greater obedience, which leads us to greater insight and so on. So a good, a good reader is an increasingly obedient reader. Uh, a, a increasingly obedient reader is a better and better reader of Scripture. I want to unpack this too in, uh, in under the heading of sp spiritual reading, which I uh, have there on your notes. Spiritual has to be capitalized here because when I'm when I'm talking about spiritual reading, I'm talking about reading that is a, uh, in in step with the Holy Spirit. Um, reading that is uh, in constant prayerful conversation with the Holy Spirit, a reading that is an expression of the fruits of the Spirit, uh, reading that grows out of the things that the Spirit is producing in us. And uh, uh, we could, we could uh, take the time to go through all the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and think about how each of them gives us an insight into proper reading habits and proper, uh, proper response to God's word. But I want to take the uh, first of these, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, 
and then mash up the fruit of the Spirit with 1 Corinthians 13, which is Paul's passage, great passage on love, and, to, uh, and think about what it means for us to be spiritual readers in the sense of loving readers. What does it mean to read in love? Um, Paul doesn't say this. I think it's an aspect of love, though. Uh, love is attentive. If you love someone, you're attentive to their needs. If you truly love someone, you're attentive to the person whom you love, not just to their needs, but to who they are, to their habits, to their uh, preferences. Um, an attent- a, a loving reader is an attentive reader. God has spoken to us. God has recorded his words in the scriptures, and we are uh, loving readers when we pay attention to what he's spoken, pay attention to everything he's spoken, not uh, neglect, not to think something is too small for us to, uh, we can just kind of skip over some parts of the Bible because uh, that can't be important. No, if we're loving readers, then we're attentive to everything that he spoke to us. Paul says that love is patient. And I want to suggest that spiritual reading, loving reading, is reading that's patient. I think we're often very impatient in our reading of scripture and of everything else. I mean, we're living in an age where we get most of our news by scrolling through our phones, glancing at headlines, don't really recognize, don't really, uh, we tend not to explore things in much depth. But in order to be good readers of scripture, we have to be patient readers. And that involves at least uh, willingness, the commitment to read and reread, and then re-reread, and so on. Uh, Robert Penn Warren, uh, the American poet and novelist, uh, said that the best and most natural reading of a poem does not occur on the first reading or on the tenth, but on the hundredth reading. Try that if you're trying to understand the the Iliad, for example. You'll understand the Iliad after a hundredth reading of the Iliad. Um, That's that's, uh, readerly patience, that we uh, return to the scriptures again and again and again, uh, so that they're gradually seeping into us, they're gradually becoming, uh, in in a sense, one flesh with us. We become a, a kind of embodiment of the word that we read and reread uh, by the power of the Spirit. Uh, patience also means being attentive to uh, the way the, the literature works. This is a lot of what I've been talking about over the last number of hours. Um, we can um, slip into to bad habits of reading where we uh, have uh, we skim the surface of a text, whether it's a biblical text or another text, uh, and uh, we don't really Uh, pay attention to the twists and turns of how the text goes. And in order to be good readers, we need to be patient enough to, to, uh, to follow those twists and turns. Paul says love is not puffed up. Love is humble. And I want to suggest that spiritual reading, uh, reading in love, has to be humble reading. And this has several dimensions to it. Um, It was a uh, a, a truism of medieval uh, textual interpretation uh, to say that an author was somebody with authoritas. An author is somebody with authority. Which means that for the medievals, not everybody who jotted something down on paper was an author. <laughs> you, had to, uh, you had to qualify to be an authority. You might read something that wasn't, doesn't have an authoritative author, but the, one, the text that were worth the worth paying attention to were the texts that were written by an authority. Which means that reading them means, uh, that implies that reading a text uh, by an author means a subjection to his authority. And that involves all the, all the habits of reading that uh, I've alluded to throughout the day, trying to follow the form of the text, trying to follow the words on the page, trying to understand what it means, what the words mean in their various uh, levels of context. It means accepting the world that the author gives to us. We have this, we have this, uh, uh, this, this is our uh, 
natural habit, as it were, our learned habit of reading when we're reading fiction. Uh, there's, a, as Coleridge said, a suspension of disbelief. Uh, we accept the world that the author is giving us. Uh, we're not going to be good readers of a science fiction book if we say, well, I just don't believe that those kind of creatures exist. Well, okay, you should probably find something else to read then, because you're not going to be a good reader of that book. You've got to give, you've got to subject yourself to the world that the author is presenting to you. Uh, that's true of any kind of reading. In scripture, we're being presented the real world in a way that we might not recognize it, because we don't, we don't know the real world as we ought. And so we have to subject ourselves to the authority of the author and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, accept the world that is presented by the text. Uh, one part of humility is acknowledging that there are better readers than we. That some people are better at reading the Bible than we are. Uh, this, I, 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 I probably shouldn't have left this to the last two minutes because I think this is hugely important. Uh, I, I know in my own experience, the way I've learned to read the Bible with any kind of depth is by being around people who read it in enormous depth and learning from them. Uh, that's the way we learn things all the time. We learn by imitation, we learn by example, we learn by mentoring. Uh, we, don't, we don't learn language or linguistic skills. There are rules involved, but we don't learn linguistic skills by following a set of rules. We learn it by uh, modeling ourselves on people who do it well. But that involves recognizing that there are people who are doing it better than we are. And that's uh, maybe hard to swallow. Uh, part of humility too, I think, is being willing to read in the, within the community of believers. Uh, much of what I've been saying uh, and, uh, and written on hermeneutics, unfortunately, has uh, implicitly assumed a kind of individual before his Bible kind of model. And I'm I would need to rewrite everything that I've written about hermeneutics to try to correct that. Um, the best I can do at this point is to say, um, that's not a good model. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it gets at only a, a, some, some slice of the reality. Uh, we read as members of uh, a Christian church. We read among other readers. We hear the Bible among other hearers. And we should be not only hearers, but doers and speakers of Scripture. Learning to be good readers means being humble enough to accept correction from fellow readers who may be better readers, who may have noticed things that we didn't notice, who may recognize that we're misreading something, and we'll point it out. Uh, reading uh, humbly, reading in love, reading with love that's not puffed up, uh, means reading in community. Um, that can be a community of other members of your church, the community of uh, students of the Bible as you're reading books and commentaries, the community of the church throughout the ages. Uh, there's lots of different sizes of community, but uh, an isolated reader is uh, not going to be a, a loving reader because he's not going to be a humble reader. And the last thing I'll say about this, and then I'll stop for the day, is that uh, love does not seek its own, Paul says. Uh, love does not seek its own. We don't read and study scripture uh, merely for the sake of uh, building up our own repertoire of, uh, uh, of, of biblical skills or, or being able to uh, uh, you know, win a Bible memorization contests or whatever. Uh, we're not, uh, as I say on the notes, we're not called to be reservoirs of biblical knowledge. We're called to be rivers. Uh, we... Uh, we read lovingly if we read in order to share, in order to teach. Uh, that can be a formal kind of teaching in a church setting or a, a school setting, uh, but it can also be a very interpersonal kind of informal teaching. We're always teaching one another, uh, whether we intend to or not, uh, and um, we should uh, uh, look for opportunities to share the things that we've received so that we can uh, be a means of life to uh, our fellow believers. We receive in order to give, we hear uh, in order to do, and we hear in order to speak. We have our ears open so we have something to say to our uh, fellow believers. I'm going to stop there and I've left you four minutes for questions. Sorry to, uh, to squeeze out the question time.
but I'll take some questions. Yeah, Chris. Yes. Uh, let me try to repeat back the question and tell me if I got it right. Uh, the question uh, is, um, uh, I'm, I've been emphasizing the inseparability of form and content, um, but there are certain things that uh, um, uh, in scripture that uh, are shaped by particular cultural circumstances that give particular form to it. How do we, how, is, this, is this the direction of the question? Yeah, and so how do we how do we work through the issues of uh, taking the form of the text seriously while at the same time recognizing that there may be things that are given that are not specifically um, applicable uh, to us in our cultural circumstances? Is that that the kind of question? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I'll acknowledge that. Um, I agree with you that there are such things in scripture that, I mean, there, uh, um, some of the obvious ones are um, uh, practices of Old Testament worship and piety that we simply are not required to uh, do anymore. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to keep purity laws. We don't have to uh, avoid um, bacon, fortunately. Uh, we, we don't have to uh, uh, worry about uh, impurity uh, in, in, the, in the way they did, we don't worship through sacrifice. Uh, we don't have to worry about sacred spaces that are off limits to certain kinds of people. Uh, so those are, those are all, those are not really cultural differences, but those are redemptive historical differences. Um, uh, maybe, another, maybe you're thinking of examples in Paul's letters where he seems to be addressing things that are culturally specific to, uh, to first century uh, uh, Gentile, Jewish and Gentile churches. Um, well, I think that uh, I, acknowledge, I acknowledge that that's a possibility. Uh, that would be my first, res first kind of response, that that's a possibility we should reckon with. Uh, at the same time, even where we conclude that what Paul is talking about uh, is something that's uh, specific to first century uh, the first century situation. And, uh, I'll take an uh, example of First Corinthians 14 and dealing with tongues. I'm not a charismatic, so I don't think that that particular phenomenon continues on into the present. And yet, there are certain ways of that Paul is presenting that teaching. Uh, we can still follow the uh, the form of his uh, the form of the text uh, and re receive the content. See how he's reasoning about that particular issue in ways that are, are, are we can find analogous, we can reason by analogy. If, if Paul says, handle tongues and prophecy in the church in this way, that may give us a, an insight into handling certain kinds of issues within the church today. We think, uh, I wouldn't want, in, in some ways it's a kind of abstraction of principles and then we apply the principles. I'm more inclined to think we should think there's a, there's a set of circumstances here and then there's a analogous set of circumstances over here and we can reason similarly about about the two we can reason about the the this new this new set of circumstances from the way paul addressed his so um that, that would be my very very general answer it doesn't get you very far but but I, I guess the point is that even when we even when we conclude that paul is addressing something that is specific to his time period um and has particular cultural connotations to it. Uh, we can still we can still apply Paul analogically to uh, our lives and the lives of our churches. Yes, ma'am. Can you make that so one of the examples you gave was a sacred place that in the Old Testament you couldn't go into. Yeah. Mm. Woman's womb, so the woman's womb 
tabernacle, a new temple. The high priest is represented by the husband, mm. so that's God's sacred space for life. Mm. So that's it hasn't been eradicated; it's just been changed. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't make it so specific. I think that um, um, you could say the same thing about um, the the tomb. There there are. Uh, John's Gospel, particularly, there's a, um, there are, um, the, the scene at the tomb of Jesus after his resurrection has a number of uh, similarities to the, to the most holy place. Um, uh, John, and, uh, John and Peter go in and there's a slab, there an, there's an angel on either side, his clothes are rolled up. Uh, those all have some kind of connection with the Day of Atonement and the, uh, and the, uh, um, uh, and the priest's work in, inside the most holy place. But that's a, that's a that's an in, a, 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 an inversion of old covenant uh, of the old covenant world because the a tomb would be a place of intense impurity rather than holiness. So tomb is death, but womb is life. Well, well, the tomb is what I'm saying is the tomb has become also become a holy place, and that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't want to say. Um, uh, the womb is a sacred place now, um, exclusively, and I wouldn't want to say that, partly because there are other places that the, the New Testament describes in terms of sacred places. I think more generally, I, would, I think the, the more general movement of the New Testament is that um, uh, Jesus has, uh, well, at his death, the, the veil of the temple is rent. Is rent. There's um, that distinction, that kind of distinction between the holy and the common, I think is uh, completely reordered in the new covenant. Uh, there are no more, uh, there, there's no more a single space as it was in the old covenant where God was, that God dwelt, where his name was placed, that was accessible only to certain people. That does, just doesn't exist. And the whole ordering of sacred and common is, uh, is changed. Um, so uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a general way to state it. So you could say that there, um, it's, that could mean everything is common, uh, so you don't have any sacred places at all. It could mean that everything is at least poten potentially a place of God's dwelling, a sacred place. Uh, but I, I'd be hesitant to specify uh, the womb or the tomb, say, you know, uh, that those are specific sacred places um, I think it's it's a more general reordering than that. If that if that makes sense to you. Yes, we have the last question. Yes. Um, so to my reading in a loving way, specific to people's needs. Yeah. Um, when I had to write Bible teaching material with other colleagues, I often find myself arguing with them the Bible's more psychological than they think it is, and I think often. They're not convinced because they think, even if that's right, or it's a good observation, pastorally it doesn't really matter, it doesn't really make a difference mm. to the pastoral needs of the people we're reading for if this is the type of Jesus that are outside of the allowed trio of the priest and king. Like, they're okay, they have pastoral significance, the other stuff, you know, scratch your beard and things like this, wrong, it doesn't matter. Why is it loving and pastoral to mm. read the Bible in the way that yeah, thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, how, what are the pastoral implications of this way of reading? How does that, um, how does that, um, how is that pastorally useful, edifying to uh, the church? One, uh, one way that I think it's edifying is that it, um, uh, if you teach the Bible in a way that uh, presents it as a, as a unity uh, with, a, with a, with a beauty and a richness to it, uh, that um, that inspires people to read read scripture. Uh, we just had uh, Alistair Roberts, who is a, a theologian. He lives here in England. He's up in Durham. He came and did a course for us. And before he gave his course, he did an evening lecture on his new book about Exodus. Um, and he just went through a whole series of scenes from the Bible that are Exodus stories. And for the people he was talking to, this was brand new stuff. And they went away thinking, 
Kelly, what else have I missed? I'm going to have to be, read the Bible a lot more carefully than I've been reading it because I just, I completely missed this. This is all over the place and I just missed it. So if you, uh, teaching the Bible in a way that in, in, incites or elicits delight in scripture, that's pastorally edifying by itself. Uh, I have on the uh, notes, the last, uh, the last entry on the notes has the word quadriga on it, which is the fourfold method of interpretation that was used by medieval theologians. Um, and I think that's another direction for answering the question. Um, the, fourfold, the four senses of scripture are the literal sense, the allegorical sense, which means typology or Christology, the tropological sense, which is moral sense, and the anagogical sense, which is an eschatological sense. So in the classic example is the, the city of Jerusalem. Literally, when the Old Testament mentions Jerusalem, it's talking about the city that was the capital city of David's kingdom. Allegorically, it's talking about the Christian church. Tropologically, it can talk about, it, it can be applied to uh, the, the church as a, um, uh, something that more, applies morally to the church or to the, an individual Christian can be seen as a kind of fortress city. Um, and the anagogic was the, uh, of Jerusalem is uh, the, the new Jerusalem of the end. So the fourfold method, but that has built into it a way of combining a Christological reading of the Bible that immediately implies something about the way we're to live. So if you have an Old Testament event, you interpret it literally that that is a type of Christ. Because we're in Christ, that also applies to us. But read, rather than, the advantage of that is that it combines, uh, it, it, it keeps together the grace of being in Christ with the moral demand of following Jesus and living. Uh, rather, than, rather than taking a text of the Old Testament and saying, well, we're just going to apply this directly to people's lives and, and leave the Christological part out of it. Well, then you're just turning the Old Testament into a moralistic uh, set of moralistic stories. You might as well read Aesop's fables because it's a lot more straightforward. <laughs> Some of the biblical stories are not so straightforward ethically. <laughs> what do you do with all this lying and deception that the patriarchs do? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Um, so applying it directly and morally is, is, can have some problems. And, and you're leaving Jesus out, <laughs> which is kind of the main thing. And I th so there's a theological advantage to uh, taking the text, first of all, as Christological, and then saying it applies to you because you're in Christ. Uh, I think there's also kind of an imaginative uh, advantage. Um, if you can teach people to imagine their lives in terms of Scripture, and to begin to see their lives in the categories that Scripture presents, uh, then uh, their individual life becomes one episode within this much grander story that still resembles some of the big story. It has some of the same features and uh, some of the same uh, some of the same uh, kinds of events as the big story does. Uh, you know, we go through all kinds of Exodus experiences ourselves, uh, where we're uh, in some kind of exclusion and exile, and the Lord brings us out into a new and fruitful land. We can, we can see those kind of patterns in our lives, um, but seeing them as kind of eddies on the big stream of Scripture is, I think it's, um, it's imaginatively refreshing, and it, uh, gives, it gives people a way of, uh, of uh, uh, making, sense of their, making sense of their lives. When I, when I preach, I, some, I sometimes, quite rarely, give do's and don'ts. That's not generally what I'm after. But I try to make my, I, I think my preaching, I want my preaching to be practical, but really what I'm aiming at more than anything is a kind of transformation of imagination. I want people to see their lives differently in the light of scripture. And uh, seeing, the, seeing how scripture works and how all of scripture fits together, I think is a way of awakening that imagination.